Hello. Um, we're ready to get started on the next session. Uh, it's data for the people by the people. Um, we have an exciting lineup here, uh, starting with Bastian um, Grisha yep. um, from OpenSNP, uh, Melissa Handel and Eric Turner from Oregon Health Sciences, Robin Rice from University of Edinburgh, and Eric Dones from Inspire. So because these are lightning 12-minute talks, we're not going to have any questions in between unless they finish early, then they'll have a, one or two questions. Um, but we'll please save them to the end because we have a panel right afterwards. Yes, this seems to work great. Okay, so I'd like to talk about crowdsourcing human genetics, and if you do human genetics, you have to present this slide, basically, which shows you the cost for sequencing a human genome over time. So the red line you'd see is Moore's law, where the prices decrease by half every 18 months, and we see that starting in like 2008, prices really, really dropped sharply, and sequencing is now basically dirt cheap which means that if you want to do genetic testing on yourself, you can pretty easily do so by just going to Amazon and buy a test. So for example, here Ancestry DNA basically costs you $100, then you can get insights in at least parts of your own genome, and if you want to make sense out of it and want to learn about human genetics in itself, you will have to pay over twice as much to just get the book on reading about human genetics. So this has the effect that basically now everyone, or many, many people are getting their genomes tested somehow. So if we look at the growth in direct-to-consumer genetic testing by 23andMe and by Ancestry.com, we see that by now each company is over like one million customers. So this means there are two million people who have insights into their own genomes, or at least parts of it. And now the big question is, why are people doing it and what can they learn? And the main reason people used to do it before the FDA at least sh did shut down this for 23andMe was medical results. So people were interested in figuring out what does my genome tell me about my health results? So people were looking into elevated risk and whether they had inherited conditions they will pass on to their offspring. So those are my results, for example, and also my ancestry you can look into then which might be more interesting for people who are not from Western Europe like I am, because my genome tells me I'm Western European, so no surprise there, but for other people, this might be cool. And that's not only it, but you can do much more things with it as well. And for this, we have to go a bit back to Mendelian genetics, and some of you might have seen like the first book of Mendel yesterday evening at the reception, and it basically tells you if I, for example, have like two copies of an A inherited from my parents, then my mother and my father will also have this. And what can I now do with this? Because, well, if, I, if this is a dominant trait and I have like this red condition, then I also know that my parents both will have the same red condition somehow. But what are those conditions? So what you get from genetic testing is like this huge list of just having seen the different letters of your genome and seeing, okay, I have two copies of an A, I might have a C and a G, or a T and a C, and so on. And now you can go to public databases, and for example, thanks to Creative Commons licensing and people who are just doing like a wiki-based project like the Snopedia, people are reading primary literature, they're summarizing it up, putting it into a semantic media wiki, basically, and then you can start looking for things like well, basically all the different genetic variations known and the effects of them. And in this case, we can see, okay, if you have two copies of an A, you will have a 1.5 times risk for prostate cancer compared to the general public. And the same is also true if you have only one copy of the A. So if we now go back to this, we can go back to my family tree. I do have two copies of this A. I have the elevated risk for prostate cancer, but so does my dad because it's a dominant allele, basically. And actually, I did this. So I did go back to my dad and say, well, actually, you know, I did this genetic testing, and I have to tell you, you really should go to pre-screening for prostate cancer now. You're already, like, well in your 50s in any case, so depending on which medical doctor you ask, you should go in any case. But I suggest you really should give it a try. And he did. He did go to the doctor. They found elevated PSA levels. They did do a biopsy, which proved he had already lots of tumors. And he was operated, and today my dad is fine, and so the take-home message basically is Creative Commons and open licensing saved the life of my dad. So great news for open science. But for this to work, basically what we need is lots and lots of studies done on human genetics. And for this, you do basically genome-wide association studies. What you do is you compare like a case study, a case group of like, for example, here on the left-hand side, you see the people with the red markers, and you see people on the right which don't have the disease or a trait you're interested in. And then you look into their genomes and say, okay, in the best case, if I look at the healthy people, I see it's only like this yellow variant. 
And if I look at the somehow people who are sick, they have all the red variants. So by just looking at a single genetic marker, I can already tell you whether you will have the disease or not. But in most cases, it's not really that simple. So you have to do the studies on lots and lots of people with like thousands and ten thousands and maybe even one hundred thousand people to find any signal because it's not that simple. So this is where we can go back to direct-to-consumer genetic testing. As I told you earlier, we have already two million people at least partially sequenced, so we could already use this data to provide really great studies. But unfortunately, open data is not that easy because, as we've seen, the number of data sets is growing really sharply, but the data which is publicly available is growing basically not at all, or at least not at a comparable rate somehow. And you could use this data. For example, 23andMe internally, they do all these studies. So they found like six new risk loci for Parkinson's disease using 100,000 people from their own database. They find new markers for motion sickness, for example. But if you're an academic researcher and you want to get access to it, it's not that easy because the data is closed for various reasons, but one of them also is that you can make good money of selling access to it. So last year, 23andMe sold their access, for example, to Genentech for 60 million. They had a deal with Pfizer. So if you have big money for your studies, then you can easily get access. But if you already have lots of money, then you can just sequence your own cohort somehow. So that's kind of pointless for many people. So what I wanted to do with my project called OpenSNP is opening this up. So as I said, there are 2 million people, and if only like some percent of those people would donate their data into the public domain, but we would be good to go already for really nice studies. So I basically, in my spare time, asked a friend who also likes the program and said, well, what do you think of this crazy idea I had? Let's make a website where people collect their genetic data. They also annotate it using phenotypic information. We will mine some external resources for the annotations and put all of this into the public domain, the source code as well, so whatever happens, people can just start using it. We should also make it somehow easy for people to be contacted by researchers if they want to participate in studies. And yes, the first question is, why would people actually do this? Donating their data into the public domain, genetic data is kind of crazy. So we wondered whether this would happen or not, and under which conditions basically people would do it. And first of all, we thought about, okay, what should our terms of services be? And we decided to make it really completely open, because then, in a way, we can just say, well, we told you from the beginning there is zero privacy. So we started out writing our terms of service, and this is the complete terms of service you are seeing there. So it's not legalese, it's not Facebook, it's like basically a single page, and it tells you if you donate your data, the worst thing that can happen is you lose your job, you lose your health insurance, and the same will also happen to your family because they share parts of your genome. And, well, even if your genome is kind of unproblematic today, tomorrow you might find new studies which tell you you have terrible diseases and all changes. Would you still like to donate your data? Yes, go ahead. If you have some kind of second thoughts, please don't. We want to don't want to coerce anyone into doing it. And still people are doing it. So right now we have like over 2,500 people who said, well, yeah, it might be a bit risky given what we just told me. I'll do it anyway. And additionally, we are really now mining different databases, so people can look into the Snippedia, we have the Public Library of Science, so people see what like open access research says about their genetic variants. We annotate the data using Mendeley. We also mine the Personal Genome Project and even the GBOS catalog by the uh, genome.gov pages. So there's lots of annotations for people if they're interested. And we also, as I said earlier, we want to collect phenotypes, and those are also crowdsourced. And this is where things are getting a bit messy, because if you ask people to just annotate their own body somehow, people get really creative, so you get what you like to expect. So there's people talking about their eye color, about their hair color, about whether they're colorblind or not. But you get also like kind of weird ones like, tell me about your political orientation, because there might be some genetic influence on whether you are left or right leaning. But I mean, it gets people engaged, so it's all people who are interested in their own bodies and genetics and they just start doing it, and I guess for a first start it's really nice. And yes, so as I said, it's all uh, licensed, or it's all donated in the public domain using the Creative Commons Zero license. And if you want to export our data, you can just go basically to opensnip.org, there's the download the data button on the front page, you will get one huge compressed archive containing all of our data. And there's also APIs if you want to download just parts of it, and if you want to use it like for your statistics in R right away, you can just use R OpenSci, which for example has our APIs already built in. So 
what are now the use cases for this kind of open data? And first of all, what we have is people are basically doing genetic code review, I like to call it. So people are actually analyzing the data sets which are publicly available and are getting back to people. And for example, this is what I got in my inbox one day. Some medical doctor analyzed my own genome and told me, oh, well, so you are European, fair enough, I knew this. You are also a carrier for this weird kind of marker, but there's only poor evidence, so don't worry about this terrible heart disease. And last but not least, there's also good news, your parents weren't closely related. Okay, so this is what might happen, for example, if you put your genome out there. Then people are also looking into ancestry using our data, and you might remember that a couple of years back they found the skeleton of Richard III and this car park in the UK. Turns out we have three people in our database who are somewhat closely related, at least, to him. And people are also using it for research into genomic privacy, because this is what is rarely done so far. And this study from Switzerland, for example, they used the data to find out that you can also use just observable phenotypic traits to find the correct genotyping data in our database and then predict all the other traits. So I just look at you, I know your hair color, I know your eye color, and maybe a couple of other things. Then I can correctly pinpoint your data set in our database and then predict like all the other medical traits you couldn't see. So this is what many people, for example, might not have thought about before putting their data on, but this is what, at least in a small, limited sample so far, worked already. So in terms of genetic privacy, it's also definitely putting things into perspective of what you have to think about before doing it. So last but not least, also people are using our data for education. So it's either, either just doing online courses or people are just teaching themselves about human genetics. So and it's much more interesting if you have real data around. So what I want for an end to say is, well, it's, as I said, it's a community effort. So we are just basically between three and six people running this website in our spare time. We are not associated with any university or institution. And we are now completely crowdfunded as well. So it's really a community effort run by the people for the people. And we are also will probably have a couple of students now working over the summer for the first time on the project. And well. This is basically the quote I always like to share because this is what motivates us to do it. We also think that everyone should be able to do human genetics research. And by now, thanks to open data, you don't need to have any lab equipment yourself. You can just do it by just downloading data and having like, your own ideas with it. And yes, that's it. Thanks for the attention. <laughs> to replug something in? Thanks. I think all the rest of them are on here, so this should be good. Thank you, thanks. So, um, Thanks to Bastian, because that was actually the, the perfect lead-in uh, for my talk. So um, it's actually really great to give you all uh, this talk today. Um, I, today I'm going to talk about something um, that we uh, fondly refer to um, in our consortium as phenopackets, which are essentially a packet of phenotype data that you can pass around in very many different contexts. And when I was, I was trying to explain what the idea was that we all try to operate on these different types of phenotype data in very many contexts, we have a really difficult time making that data interoperable. And so just like in, in Bastian's talk, you know, it's really hard to take what one person says about their genome in one context and make that interoperable with, you know, public health data in another context or model organism phenotype data or biodiversity data. So phenopacket is essentially a way to um, have shared infrastructure for sharing that information, uh, never minding what sort of vocabularies one might use to describe it. And the idea is that it's, it's fair, but fair with a plus plus in the sense that we're here adding another A, which I know might make some people uncomfortable, <laughs> uh, which is that it's also attributable and we can actually track the provenance of the information that people are sharing. 
So um, as we just heard, there's, you know, for, for rare disease, um, the situation is uh, actually really much more difficult um, than some of the public health stories that we've heard here, where in fact there just simply isn't, we're not utilizing effectively all the data we have. We're not usually utilizing effectively the data we have um, from the patients um, in terms of the phenotyping that can be done in the patients as well as the environmental history of the patient. And conversely, on the public side, we're not really using public phenotype data or environmental data to help with the diagnostics for rare disease patients. And for rare disease patients, it's absolutely critical for both diagnosis as well as for uh, mechanism understanding discovery to find cohorts globally. And so there's a real challenge in matchmaking patients that may have ends of, you know, where the disease is an N of two globally. So, um, our group works on uh, um, semantics and ontologies for representing phenotype data and has been working for some time on use of um, representation of phenotypes to use the model organism data to help with the disease diagnosis where we have an N of one for rare disease patients. So essentially filling our knowledge gap by, by using this model data, we can actually um, prioritize genes that may be responsible for um, a rare disease in a patient where we may have a thousand candidates that could be responsible, uh, and those candidates may be genes that we know absolutely nothing about because we only really know uh, something about approximately 20% of the human coding genome. So, and this is a, a paper recently where we um, uh, used this approach in a tool called Eximizer to prioritize variants um, based on phenotype data described in the same way in a mouse as we were describing the patients in terms of its uh, phenotypic characterization um, in uh, having uh, uh, platelet phenotypes in particular. And in this case, there simply was no data in the public repositories, and we actually had to lean on that data from the mouse to help diagnose this patient. So this is the premise for why we need a better exchange mechanism, because as, in fact, there are um, now, I believe, we're up to 23 families globally that have uh, mutations in this gene um, that have this particular phenotype and also gets after how we define disease, which is not so easy. Um, so how can we actually make these data more computable, both from the perspective of the, the patients globally that, that, we that may want to share their data um, themselves, that may, we may want to share that clinical data in a variety of contexts, essentially a proxy of the phenotypic information that might be held in a very deep way in the EMR. So what if we all helped do this? How can we actually help uh, patients help themselves, help clinicians help themselves, disease registries? Um, help these patients find each other globally and help also help find the scientists um, that might be studying a mouse or a fruit fly or a yeast that um, can actually help with the diagnosis. So, you know, the central dogma of biology, um, for those of you who are, who are not biologists, is that essentially um, the interaction between uh, our genetic makeup and the environment results in phenotypic outcomes, and of course that process is temporal. Um, as we uh, grow up through our, our life. But it's really complicated. It actually looks like that, right? So, you know, co we're constantly, you know, we, we are only just barely scratching the surface of understanding how environmental effects actually affect um, various aspects of our genome and its expression, um, which then lead to the outward uh, effects of the phenotypes, and then the phenotypes, in fact, can uh, thereby also affect um, gene expression, and it's just very complicated mess. So if this is our central dogma, we have to come up with standards that can help make some sense of this in order that we can um, help with these rare disease diagnostics. So we have quite a few standard exchange formats for representing sequence data, such as um, GFF files, VCF files, BED files, all used in different contexts uh, to represent genomic or sequence data. Uh, but what we don't have is actually an exchange format for representing environmental data or phenotypic data. Um, and it's, it's because it's hard. I mean, the reality is, is that, you know, we're talking about sequence data, well, there's only four base pairs, whereas there are literally an infinite number of ways to describe a phenotype. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't come up with a good exchange mechanism for sharing that information. And if we define a priori the vocabularies or the constraints that we might use to describe those phenotypes, we can still pack package them up in a phenopacket in the same sort of way um, that we might package up sequence data uh, for exchange purposes. So introducing phenopackets, here we go. It's exactly what you think it is. It's a packet of phenotype data. <laughs> Um, so what does a phenopacket look like? Well, 
Hopefully you can see that. It's a bit bright up here. I don't know if they can turn the lights down. <laughs> um, so um, the, the <laughs> it's very bright, actually. That light's shining right in my eye. So, um, so a pheno packet looks like this. It essentially is um, a structured format for exchanging, exchanging phenotype data. Um, so here we have an example where, with, and its um, canonical form is JSON format, and you can see that Donald Trump really likes that format quite a lot. Um, <laughs> and uh, here, you know, we can describe, you know, the, what's in the FINA packet. It's, it's a, here we have a patient, something about his sex, uniquely identify him, um, but not in the PHI sense, but just in the entity in the world sense. Um, but because here we're going to attach other data to this entity. In this case, this, um, this patient or citizen has a phenotype of having small hands that um, this description occurred during development as congenital onset. And it was a traceable author statement made by me, in fact. <laughs> so this is really... Um, you know, a silly example, but the idea is that, you know, if we just define the vocabularies that we want to use or the standards that can go in here, in this case we're using the human phenotype ontology to describe these phenotypes and define the constraints that we might have in there, um, then we can actually uh, exchange this packet of phenotype information in very many different contexts. So, one of those contexts, and because we're in the data for the people, by the people, is that, um, let's see, how am I doing for time? Um, is that we want to be able to provide patients the ability to use the same kind of diagnostic um, comparisons. Um, and just as Bastian was talking about, um, you know, really, you know, being able to tell if you have X and Y phenotypes, then you might also have Z phenotypes. So that's exactly what we're trying to do here is match make those phenotypes across different patient cohorts where the patient cohorts are very, very small. Um, so this is an example from the Engli One um, uh, uh, website, um, which is collating patients um, that have mutations in this gene Engli-1, which is a, a glyco disorder. Um, and in this case, this, this patients might describe their phenotypes as being um, dry eyes and having developmental delay and elevated liver function, among other phenotypes. And this would be translated then into a pheno packet that could be posted in a variety of places. Maybe it's posted um, via DOI and, and, and submitted uh, to Figshare and posted on Twitter, or maybe it's posted in Facebook. They can, um, disease registries can use it. But the point is, is that um, based on the um, uh, translation that one can do between layperson terms and actual structured, computationally actionable phenotypic descriptions, one can then create these data packets um, and uh, push them to patient registries and social media. Um, and also thanks to um, Nicole Vasilevsky and Aaron Foster, who are both here today, they have actually translated this ontology vocabulary for describing rare disease phenotypes into layperson ease. And have a, uh, um, be happy to talk to you about that. So, three minutes, okay. Perfect. Um, so basically, um, this is not limited to patients, as I mentioned. If it's alive, it can be put in a phenopacket. So, you know, of course, here we're really interested in rare disease diagnosis um, and personalized medicine for how do we apply particular drugs to particular um, patient cohorts that have specific phenotypes. But we're also really interested in how do we represent um, in epidemiological monitoring um, to you know, help share phenotype data across different contexts where we might want to mash up data from the kind of uh, social network, um, uh, social data that, that John works on with potentially you know, uh, oceanographic um, types of data that are being collected um, uh, um, by you know, some of the um, researchers studying, you know, global um, environmental patterns, right? So this is really the idea is to help make this data more computable in many different contexts. So also for drug discovery and development, mechanistic discovery, um, the biodiversity community, and we have Anne Thiessen here from the uh, Encyclopedia of Life is really interested in representing um, phenotypic data from different um, biodiversity perspectives uh, so that um, citizen scientists can actually contribute um, to essentially what is sort of our Wikipedia of biodiversity, the Encyclopedia of Life, um, you know, that that data can be attributable and contributed in, in a variety of different ways in a comp computationally actionable form so that we can learn more about the distribution of species on our Earth and the evolutionary relatedness of, of them. And then finally, uh, genetic engineering for crops and, in, uh, and um, domestic animals as well, and we have a lot of interest from the, those communities. So, also journals, 
um, thanks to the Force 11 efforts of the Data Citation Implementation Group, um, we actually now have an extension to the JAT standard in the publishing. So you can now publish any kind of data set as a regular citation via a DOI or other standardized identifier. And um, in fact, we're going to take advantage of that fact uh, for publishing pheno packets alongside different journals and have a number of journals that are now working with us to publish pheno packets. Um, and with that, I will close with some thanks uh, to a large number of people and to some uh, preliminary funding to help uh, fund this work, as well as the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, the Monarch Initiative, the Undiagnosed Disease Network, and the International Rare Disease Consortium. So thanks. Hello. I'm, I'm Robin Rice from the University of Edinburgh. Um, I'm sorry I don't have a Scottish accent for you. I've, I've been there since 1998 and it's just not happening, so. Um, so I'm a data librarian and uh, I, was, I was thinking about how, how this talk fits in with, um, with these others uh, sandwiched in between these brilliant geneticists and things. So I'm kind, I've figured out I'm kind of the back to basics talk in this session, um, just talking about uh, what's going on right now with uh, overcoming the obstacles to sharing data. I'm a, I'm a data sharing advocate like the rest of you. Um, in our day-to-day -day work, we help people find data to use, um, manage it, share it. And uh, I think the, the idea, um, in some sense, data about human subjects and data sharing is kind of the elephant in the room. Um, and I might have stolen that from Cliff Lynch, who said something along those lines that got me thinking uh, a year or two ago at the International Digital Curation Conference. Um, so I think the status quo, I, um, I could have pointed to some literature to prove this, but I, I don't think you're going to dispute it, um, and I don't have time anyway. But you know, most data under underlying published research, aside from these brilliant, you know, kinds of cutting-edge things we're hearing about today, most of it is not being shared. Even the publicly funded research is still, um, you know, there's a quite a lot of reluctance for sharing it. Um, so, in that case, how, how can those research claims be verified and all of those things we want to be doing with the open science agenda? Um, so we know there's a lot of barriers to sharing data and I won't be going over that, but um, among that list, uh, we know that confidentiality concerns run very high and almost, almost in a dismissive way, like, uh, well, you really should share your data unless it's confidential and then, of course, you don't have to. But in, there is a, one funding council I know that sort of has that um, basically uh, right off, but they're, granted they don't usually deal with human subjects. But um, So I think qualitative research data and small scale surveys, the kind of things done by a lone researcher, the kinds of things I see with our PhD students, um, they're not commonly shared, they're not commonly reused, so, um, so we're missing something there. Um, and, and we don't want these disciplines that work with human subjects in the social sciences um, and, and the clinical sciences are clearly addressing things, but is there a danger that it's falling behind on reproducibility agenda? So I think we need to think about redressing the imbalance and hopefully some of the thoughts I've been having um, as we train uh, PhD students and, and meet with users and things can help, uh, help you to think about key messages when you're talking to people who maybe aren't um, advocates like yourselves for the open science agenda. Um, so what can a researcher do to be able to share their data? Well, first, of course, plan for sharing from the beginning. We kind of heard that message earlier today. Um, for example, you, um, you can use a data management plan. You can even do that if you're not required to. Uh, and that'll help you make sure that you're managing the confidential data well and also that you're planning for sharing um, finding a, rep a suitable repository, et cetera. Um, the other things you can do is just not collect the personal information. A lot of um, new researchers, you know, will just sort of almost, for no reason at all, just be collecting name, uh, th per very personal things about people because they see it in, in the surveys, but there's, it's not one of their important variables. So, you know, ask yourself if you really need to collect it in the first place. Um, and, of course, you know, there's an informed consent 
but there's still a lot of uh, consent forms and information sheets are um, are making promises to the uh, to the participants, saying, you know, oh, this will only be seen by the researcher, you know. So that right there, you're you're counting yourself out for ever sharing it, um, and you can you can get very fine grained kinds of consent where. Yes, they participate in the research, and yes, they agree to share their data. You can tell them you're planning to anonymize it. You can tell them where you're planning to store it um, in, in the inf inf information form. Um, of course, you can document your data really well um, within the so uh, analysis packages and also keeping a data log about all the versions of your files so that you don't have that situation of being embarrassed to share your data at the end. Um, you, you can anonymize it, you can aggregate it, but you might also want to attribute um, the people you're interviewing, for example. Uh, if it's not sensitive topics, they may be proud of what they're saying and, and don't mind be co being quoted, so you can ask them. But if you do need to, um, then go ahead and anonymize it. Um, I, I know from trying this out that I don't have time to go over this entire slide, but um, if it's numeric data, uh, survey data kind of thing. You, of course, you do the stripping of the identifiers and you can do some other things like top coding and looking for outliers of very old people and low and high income and things like that. Qualitative, it's very um, standard to share the transcript rather than a audio or video. Um, it's, it's not really recommended to kind of blur the face of a video the way uh, they do in the news. And you can agree a pseudonym with the subject that's appropriate for them and, and make it part of the narrative um, quite uh, using brackets to show where you're replacing from the original text. But if you have to restrict access, then, um, then you have to restrict access. So why would you have to do that? Well, maybe just ethically, there is too much potential for harm to the research subject. Either the community, uh, a, um, a community that might be damaged by some news story, for example, or, or individu an individual within that group. Um, and of course, in, in the UK Data Protection Act, there's, uh, there's variables that, uh, there's topics that are considered sensitive by law. So things like um, uh, sexual orientation, religious views, um, ethnic origin and race, all these things are considered sensitive data by law, so you have to be careful. Um, so sometimes it's just required by either the data producer if you're using data that you got from somewhere else or the funder or the health authority. Um, so, and, and sometimes I've learned recently like with the UK Medical Research Council, it almost doesn't matter if it's anonymized. You still have to, they still expect you to go through these jumping of hoops, you know, and, and very restricted access to the data. Um, but sometimes anonymization would destroy the value of the research or it would just be impossible because the population is too special. Um, so if you have to lock it up to keep it safe, then you can still provide access through restricted um, ways um, and, and try and think about the burden on, on the user of the data what, and what kind of hoops you're making them go through. So for example, you, if you, you can't make the data openly available, but you could still make a landing page available. You could make the documentation available so they can read that to see if the data is going to suit them. Um, maybe the syntax or the code that you used on the analysis of the data, especially if it's not your own data, you could still publish that. Um, there's you can you, you can get a template for a standard data use agreement and a data access application, so you don't end up saying silly things like this will only be available to bona fide researchers or not define your term of what a bona fide researcher is. Um, which I think is, is a bad idea in, in uh, days of citizen science. But uh, and ideally, um, ideally, it's said that you're, you should have an unbiased review of those applications, but you may not have the infrastructure for that. So just bear in mind that you know this isn't about you, this is about someone's access to their data and their research, so just treat them fairly, I would say. And um, if, you, if you are trans, after all that, don't just, Pop a file in your e um, pop a file into email and send it off, not thinking about it. You've got to use secure channels, use encryption if you are transferring the data to someone. Um, yeah, and bear in mind that uh, there are reasons the public is so scared, or 
or that the public may be scared about their data getting out there on the internet. This is one example of a, um, a media piece about an article in Science that we're looking at people's credit cards. They could be identified with just four pieces of information, such as where they bought coffee that day, and if, if someone knew the price of the coffee, then it's 22% more chance of being identified. So th these, these are dangers with letting your data be out there. Um, data linkage is, um, is a method used, and sometimes very legitimately, um, for research purposes. So for example, um, matching uh, health records with um, something like, uh, I don't know, benefit record or employment record or something like that. And, um, and, and you can't do that kind of research with informed consent because it's, there's no way you, you would, the, the research wasn't even known when the data was collected. So in that case, we need information governance structures and we're beginning to get some very good ones. And, uh, and in that case, it's, it's not something a lone researcher can do. It requires a bigger infrastructure. Um, and it's, as I said, developed to meet ethical standards where informed consent not, is not possible. And then they may also be judging whether the research is enough in the public interest to let it go ahead. Um, this kind of thing is, is allowed in the European Data Directive, common to um, laws across Europe. And, and fortunately, there was some concern that it might not be uh, pursued in the next version of this um, data directive, but it, it, it looks, uh, apparently, it is going ahead. So that's, we can still use information governance and, and perfect it. And often it is uh, using it to link those data sets and doing it as a service. Okay, so um, I'm just finishing up. Just to mention these five safes, which I've heard that term from the UK Data Service. I don't know if they coined it or not, but safe data would be anonymized. Safe researcher would be, they took a training or got a certificate to be able to access it. The project is vetted, um, or they maybe have to to a remote location in a room without internet access and safe outputs, having their analysis checked before they go away. And I'm just ending with a little bit of a promo on a couple of uh, free and open online training resources on data management and sharing that we've developed. Thank you. Okay. Like it? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that's the perfect uh, lead-in for my talk because I was going to preface it by saying my talk is a bit more uh, a lower tech than most of what we've been hearing um, today. So um, I made up this acronym. Acronyms I discovered are uh, a good way to citations. I saw a poster one time that if you can create an acronym for a clinical trial, you, you're going to get a much higher citation rate uh, by, by that alone. So keep that in mind. Uh, so this, this one is parking. Uh, peer, uh, peer review after the results are known. So are we parking the cart before the horse? Um, and sorry to introduce myself, Eric Turner. Uh, I'm uh, right here at OHSU and at the Portland VA Medical Center and previously uh, worked at the, uh, at the FDA before coming here and that led into a lot of the work that I do. So first of all, uh, a day at the races. So apologies to the uh, Marx Brothers. So let's say that you are, uh, you've gone to the racetrack and there are seven horses, as you can see, to choose between and you decide to pick number one. Uh, and so off they go and the winner is number two, curses. Uh, you go up to the window and uh, I don't know why you've would go up to the window to collect your winnings, but you, I guess maybe you're feeling your, your lucky day, and he, he asks you, uh, uh, well, which horse did you bet on? And uh, he, he's asking you this, and you say, well, uh, the number two, of course. And, he's, and so what's, what do you think happens? You collect your winnings. He just, he just pays you. So what is, what's wrong with this picture? You bet on one. So what? This is, this is outrageous in the world of horse racing, but it's commonplace in the world of academic publication. So let's see, what, uh, what are we talking about here? Uh, in another, from one a horse race to a rat race, uh, you conceive your study, you uh, write your uh, protocol up, which is for your eyes only. You have a hypothesis that, that 
you know, the way you expect uh, the, the study to turn out and that you sort of codify that into a primary outcome. And then uh, while you're at it, you go ahead and you collect lots of other data. Why not? It doesn't you know, create that much additional work. Um, and uh, many other analytic methods, and uh, the more the merrier. And you go ahead and you begin uh, collecting your data, and let me just back up a second uh, and say that most of what I'll be saying has to do with uh, hypothesis confirming research, like clinical trials, as opposed to hypothesis generating research. So this is the world of a clinical trial here, and um, you collect your, you, you run your study, you uh, analyze the data according to your pre-specified uh, outcomes and methods, and uh, darn it, uh, that p-value came out above 0.05. Well, uh, never fear because there you can always try out al alternate methods to your heart's content. Uh, it's kind of fun if you uh, if you know some statistics and uh, you can kind of show off for for people and show how it. Oh well, I can just do it this way, and uh, as they say, you can torture the data, and eventually it'll confess to anything. And then you've got all this, you've done, you've done, and only then, th only at this point, only at this point, after you've gone through all this, only then do you write it up. Or not. You don't have to write it up. That's an option. So you can write up if you choose to and not publish it, when you choose to, and how you choose to. And this is the phenomenon known as outcome reporting bias or abbreviated, uh, well, not outcome reporting, but it says an abbreviated harking. Harking, uh, you ask, what does that stand for? It stands for hypothesizing after the results are known. Uh, coined by um, Norbert Kerr at Michigan State, a psychologist uh, in uh, 1998. Hmm, looks like double 1998, the doppelganger there. Anyway, you'll notice that harking I've got in the uh, red and green colors. That's uh, to uh, sort of put you in a Christmas frame of mind. Uh, because uh, hark, you know, hark the herald, and, and it's the, uh, harking is the gift that just keeps on giving. You can't, you can't lose. You run your race, you see which horse wins, you bet on the horse that just won, after the fact. Then you publish it. So, um, with that, I'm going to lead, uh, jump a little bit and talk about a study that, uh, that I was lead author on in uh, 2008 in New England Journal of medicine, selective publication of antidepressant trials and its influence on apparent efficacy. In a brief overview of the study, we looked at 12 antidepressants, uh, beginning with Prozac, which was approved in uh, 87. And we uh, obtained the drug approval packages. Now, this might sound like it um, took a lot of work, uh, but most people don't realize, and this is one thing I learned from working at the FDA, is that these are available on the FDA website for anyone. Anyone has access to them, drugs at FDA. Uh, you can just go there. They've been doing this since 1997 for uh, all new chemical uh, entities being uh, approved. So we, uh, I, you know, within the drug approval packages for each of these drugs, we identified all the pre-marketing trials. There was a total of 74 clinical trials. Uh, and then we tracked each study into the published literature and asked two questions. First of all, was the study published at all? And secondly, if it was published, was it harked uh, or uh, slash spun? Or yeah, so basically, you know, we have you could look at it this way: we have errors of omission and errors of commission, or lies of uh, omission of li lies of commission. If you're a consumer of these drugs, which, or you're a physician, you're trying to determine. Uh, just how effective is this drug, and uh, maybe you're, you know, are you being told the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So this is what we found, and this figure is not in the journal article. This is a uh, just another rendition of it, and to um, somewhat oversimplify, we've got the positive studies above the red line and the studies that did not reach statistical significance below the red line, and you can see, by and large, this is the journal version of antidepressant trials, and this was my uh, understanding of the state of affairs before going to work at the FDA. It was my understanding that antidepressants always beat placebo. Uh, in fact, I don't know that I'd read any journal articles where the drug in question or the treatment, whatever it might be, was not, uh, was not effective. So um, 
uh, this was completely consistent with my view of the world. There were a couple of studies here, three to be exact, where they actually admitted in, in the uh, results section that uh, they were not, it was not significant on the primary outcome. But by and large, uh, all, pretty much all positive. However, if you look at the FDA view of things, you see a very uh, different picture of things. You can see basically half of the studies were positive and the other half were not positive. So let me just uh, make sure you saw the, the, as the magician says, now you see it, now you don't. And this, this is what doctors and patients had been aware of and uh, that this is what the world of uh, peer-reviewed publication uh, was providing us with. But by looking in the FDA drug approval packages and to hit on the theme data by the people for the people, it was right there on, on the website, but just no one was taking advantage of it. This is the, the true state of affairs. So what became of all those negative studies? There were a, um, a big chunk of these. These are just you know, not the positive studies, but the negative studies. Um, there were, the majority of them were uh, simply not published. And here are the three that were they admitted, sort of, to a negative finding. I say sort of because the article was, uh, you know, they, they still managed to put a spin on it uh, in, in the abstract, but w according to the way that we coded things, we gave them credit for having fessed up to a negative finding. And then here are these 11 that were, had been spun or harked from negative to positive. So if we just sort of uh, zero in on those a bit, We've got these 11 <laughs> pigs with lipstick. And you can see the journal uh, view of things. Uh, of course, you know, basically, you know, significant, uh, significant, everything, everything is just wonderful. Uh, but the FDA uh, is uh, giving you a very different impression. And in case you're wondering what that negative sign is, p-values don't have signs. But I just wanted to show that in this case, it was numerically worse than placebo, which is hard to do, not statistically. <laughs> So if it was statistically worse than placebo, that would really be bad. Um, okay, well, but surely the experts weren't fooled. Um, now this is, let me just uh, point you, here, here, here are the, uh, the 11 articles, and uh, here's the journal impact factor, the citing articles, and the citing number of uh, citing systematic reviews and meta-analyses. So down here is the median, and you can see a median impact factor of about five, uh, a median number of citations per article of 68, and systematic reviews and meta-analyses. These are the experts. These are the people that are from which policy is taken from, uh, nine of those, and these are highly influential articles. So yes, it looks like at least some experts were fooled indeed. So this harking is deceptively easy if you step, step back and think about it. Um, there's something called the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. Oops, <laughs> let me go back. Um, you go back, okay, here he is, banging, uh, shooting away at this target and he's a pretty lousy shot. Um, but after the fact, he can make himself look pretty darn good. So knowing results is a powerful, powerful thing, too powerful, perhaps. And uh, it can bias journal reviewers, too. Here's a, a study that was published uh, uh, in 2010, Archives of Internal Medicine, uh, where they uh, circulated phony manuscripts for review, and they deliberately sprinkled in methodological errors. And, but there were two versions of the results, one in which the results were significant, statistically significant, uh, and those errors were missed, and uh, the reviewers tended to uh, think that the uh, methods were just fine. Uh, the other is the, there was non-significant, uh, and the errors were caught. Suddenly, the reviewers were seeing the errors, and the methods were flawed. Again, the, reason, the, the methods were the same. So what can we do about this? I think we should be of the research and emphasize the scientific process itself and be looking more at the question, the scientific question, and the rigor, the methodological rigor used to get the results. And moving the time point of interest should be less on study completion and more on study inception 
back before we can be biased by the results. So there are some sources of information that we can use. We can use registration information, such as in clinicaltrials.gov, where you can find information, of course, about the study existence. Uh, that's easy. But you can also look to see what the primary outcome was versus the secondary versus post hoc. And uh, unfortunately, yeah, this is easily checked by reviewers, but I'm afraid this is very seldom done. And uh, quickly moving along, because I'm getting the hook here. Um, drugs at FDA, uh, basically where I, what I use to get these articles uh, uh, to, to generate the, the data on the uh, anti and some other studies. Here's a how-to article in the BMJ in 2013. Clinicaltrials.gov is now um, uh, uh, posting results since 2008 on industry-sponsored trials. And now it's coming to a theater near you. If you're an NIH-sponsored researcher, you too will be subject to these rules. And if you do not, uh, if you do not comply, your next grant will be, um, will be withheld. So that's coming this year, supposedly, and any month now. And uh, finally, uh, instead of full manuscripts, we can review protocols uh, without the results is one, one way around this. And, uh, and I say protocol and not the methods section, because the methods section is written after the results are known. Um, and by the way, traditional journals could easily require protocols, but uh, very few do. Now, before study inception, uh, following the FDA model, it's actually impossible to prejudge this study based upon the results. And just after the results, a protocol could be withheld. You could just not submit if you know that your study went south. Um, but before the study uh, is, uh, takes place, you have every reason to suspect it'll be positive. And um, here is uh, finally, the, um, an effort that's taken place to do just that, and this is based in, uh, in the UK, the uh, registered reports uh, method, and uh, here, this report, trust in science, would be improved by study pre-registration. So the idea is that people uh, pre-register their studies, then they do the study, and they get the results, and, they, uh, and so you can track it back uh, all the way, and that way the publication is not hinging on the significance of the results. And it's not, uh, there are a number of journals signing on. This is beginning, the person is a psychologist who's running this effort, and I hope to see that this will spread into other disciplines as well. And I think that's it, thank you. So my name is Eric Jones, and I'm with a company called Inspire.com, which some of you might be familiar with. And uh, so first, I'm going to take a few minutes and introduce to you what Inspire is exactly. Inspire is the leading social network for health, connecting patients in, and caregivers in a safe, permission-based manner. We have uh, over 10 million unique visits per year on our social network. Over 765,000 members belong to Inspire. Approximately 31% of our members identify as caregivers and about 5% medical practitioners. Almost 90% of our people belong to just one of our over 200 health communities because they're very focused on one specific disease or condition that has brought them to Inspire. We have over 8 million posts with over 1 billion words written. We grow mostly by partnering with nonprofit agencies. While we are a for-profit co company, we partner with nonprofits to provide the social networks necessary for these nonprofits to have their members and their people be able to connect with others that have their same condition or disease. Um, it is the official online peer-to-peer -peer support community for many of the largest nonprofits. We have over 100, some of which are just listed right there. 
The quality of content on Inspire is very high. It's interesting when I uh, hear all about social networks and Facebook and Twitter and utilizing information out there because we're very proud of the community that we've built at Inspire. Uh, the average number of characters per post on Inspire is 1,695. And that's more than 16 times as long as the most common Facebook post length on, on Facebook and almost 11 times as long as the post, uh, the most common post length on Google+. Interestingly, our average reply to a post is about five times as long as the typical post itself on Facebook. So there's a lot of rich, juicy content that's available on Inspire uh, with our communities. Um, we work with uh, a number of organizations uh, over the years to um, help craft clinical trials, to run patient surveys, to connect organizations with patients, both in uh, individuals and in aggregate. It's helped many, many uh, organizations be able to, to do wonderful research. I feel a little bit out of place here in some ways because we have so many people here who are engaged in scientific research and in wonderful work, and we're not. We don't do ourselves any research. We don't do ourselves any scientific studies. We are simply providing the platform that allows people to be able to communicate. But we think we found a number of interesting things over the years that we've been in business that we think apply to a lot of what you are doing here, especially when it comes to creating community and privacy. And that's why we were asked to come and uh, be a part of this panel. So I want to, uh, to share a few things with you about Inspire and then a little bit about privacy. Um, for us, members are not siloed in one specific community because a lot of places, information is someplace else. Even though 90% of our members only belong to one community, you don't know if the drug that they're talking about in one community is actually has side effects that are mentioned in another community. So we have the challenge of being able to bridge across communities. For us, though, the big thing is that data is a result of what we do. It's not, it's the, it's the end goal, but it's not what we do primarily. We do community, and data comes from the community. We don't like to consistently throw questions at our members, for instance, say, hey, answer this one, answer that one. Because what we do want is we want for them to tell other members in their own way. And by the way, there's a stray don't in there, because we do want them to tell other members in their own way. And also, we want to respect our members' privacy at all times. We have an enormous trove of data regarding conditions and treatments. Through natural language processing of our anonymized data, we're able to uncover wonderful insights about uh, adverse events, medication, routine adherence, and many other things related to the patient journey and health experiences. The unstructured data, as you all know, is a very large challenge. We're currently partnering with Stanford University to help create tools for our specific natural language processing that goes on at Inspire, and, uh, and then supplementing the unstructured data with surveys as necessary. But it's been interesting, as I've been listening to uh, the previous keynote and, uh, and the talks that have come before, um, because one of the things that I think it's important that we all remember when it comes to patients sharing their data is there are a number of things that, that cause people to want to share data. And those things are privacy, trust, and community. And it all comes down to those three things. For us, what we've discovered is that people want to share. They very, very much want to share data. They want to share information about what they have uncovered and what they have discovered and what they have gone through because they want to know what other people have discovered and shared and gone through. But they only want to do it within their walled gardens. As I told you, Almost 90% of our members belong to just one community, even though we have over 200 of them. Why? Because they're focused on their one condition. And if they're dealing with Parkinson's, they really, really only want to connect with people who also have or are dealing with Parkinson's in some way, shape, or form. 
And what we find is that when we try to draw people out of that one community into other communities, they resist that. They say, no, I've got my group of people here who talk about Parkinson's, and this is what I'm focused on, and these are the people that I'm comfortable with. Our unchangeable default, for anytime someone writes a new post on Inspire, is public so that it's searchable by Google. You don't have to be a member of Inspire to look at the post. It's unchangeable. You can't default your settings to be anything but public. And yet, even so, almost 90% of our posts, people change the privacy of the post before they submit it to members only. I only want people within the walled garden of Inspire to see this post. And even then, they even resist having that post be visible outside of their community. We offer them the ability to write what we call a journal that can be exposed to anybody outside of the community. And they're like, no, I just want it in my one specific community. And this really gets to trust. Because as these people belong to community, we find that it is, takes them almost three months between them joining the community and creating their first post about their condition so that it takes them months and months to develop a trust with not only with Inspire, but with everybody else who is part of that community before they're willing to share that information. This makes us very different from uh, some of the other health communities out there that can be focused more on short social interactions like, like Facebook or bringing in question after question to try, their, try to gather data. As I said, for us, data is a result of what we do and not the goal in itself. People are willing to share data. They're willing to share information. But what we found is that they're only willing to share it if they know that it's anonymous and if they know that it's helping people, other people who have their condition. Our little motto that we have on our homepage of Inspire is connect with, uh, connect with others who know what you're going through. And that's really at the heart of what we think patient privacy and patient data is about. They want to connect with others who know what they're going through. They're willing to help, they're willing to share, but they want to do it in very tightly controlled circumstances so that they're helping other people who also know what they're going through because they've all been there. They were all at one point reaching out into the world and going, I need to find somebody else who knows what having this condition is like. I'm a patient of this, I'm a caregiver of this, I need help. And those are the sorts of communities that we see an awful lot of power in. Community is incredibly important and people are willing to share more when they feel that they belong to a like-minded community. So as we think about the sharing of data, and especially as you know, I'm coming at this from a very, very different perspective uh, from the, the researchers and the scientists who, who make up uh, this conference, it, it's important that we always remind ourselves that these real human beings at the core of, of the experience are wanting that trust, are wanting to develop that rapport with people. And it's a rapport that takes a long time to gather before they're willing to really open up and share the juicy data and the real information that's going to make your jobs and our jobs and the medical establishment's job so much better. So, uh, as, especially as we get on to the roundtable discussion, I just want to make sure that the, that the perspective of the individual patient and the formation of the community uh, is not forgotten because privacy and trust and community are at the core of everything we do uh, at Inspire. And uh, in addition, we work with a lot of uh, organizations uh, around the country, a lot of institutions. We work with Boston Children's Hospital, Epidemico, uh, and uh, many other places to help work with anonymized versions of our data. And we are very interested in helping to establish more partnerships because even though we are a for-profit company, at the heart of our mission is increasing the knowledge of the medical community. And our, mo our motto is specifically, Together we're better, and we want to be together 
with all of you to help create the knowledge base for the future of medicine. Thank you very much.